Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the EBTC webinar. We will give uh, one more minute uh, for everyone to get in. I see that a lot of people are logging in right now. Um, but we will start at 8.01, this session, uh, sorry, 11.01, uh, this session, uh, because we want to make sure that we have uh, enough time for discussion at the end. Okay, let's get started. Uh, hello and every uh, welcome everyone to the EBTC uh, grade uh, webinar. Uh, the topic of the webinar is how certain are we? Uh, the progress in adaptation of systematic frameworks for environmental risk assessment. And first, uh, let's, uh, uh, let's start with logistics. If you have questions to the panelists, please use the Q&A. The chat function is going to be dis uh, disabled. And this webinar is recorded and is going to be available on the EBTC YouTube channel, which we will inform you about when we upload the, the recording. And if you have any technical issues, please email uh, Camila, who is our wonderful program coordinator, and her email is displayed on the screen. With that, I would like to start uh, the session uh, with a brief introduction to the context. Um, and uh, we will display uh, the questionnaire so that we know which uh, expertise you bring in and uh, what, you're, what you want to get out of this, uh, of this webinar. So uh, this is the agenda for session two. We just finished the session one that was focused on uh, uh, mechanistic evidence. Um, and um, well, uh, I'm delighted to uh, to have all the all the speakers present their perspectives on how they assess the certainty in uh, in environmental health context. So it's quite a quite a diverse group of uh, speakers. I'm really excited to hear to hear about this. So uh, I'd like to say a few words about uh, grade uh, grade working group. So GRADE stands for uh, Grading of Recommendations, Assessment, Development, and Evaluation. And this is an approach for assessing certainty of evidence and strength in the recommendations. Uh, that's uh, over two decades uh, old uh, right now, and it's adopted by over 100 organizations worldwide. It started uh, its, uh, uh, its application in the field of medi uh, medicine and public health. But since uh, 2015, uh, there is a great environmental and occupational project uh, group that's, uh, that, um, that's devoted to furthering methodological efforts of evidence assessment and decision making in environmental health. Katja, I'm ending the poll. Thank you, Camilla. So the poll will be shared with, uh, with everyone. So, uh, I'm seeing that there is a majority of us are in risk assessment and we have more people here in systematic review methodologists and adverse outcome pathways. We had about equal in the first session. Interesting. Thank you so much. So um, now a little bit about EBDC. So evidence-based toxicology collaboration uh, is uh, a collaboration of science regulatory and industry leaders uh, that is of or united by a vision to bring evidence-based toxicology and systematic reviews 
to, uh, to become the standard that's used to ensure public health, a uh, healthy environment and sustainable future. So <clears throat> EBTC is trying to be that platform and uh, honest uh, broker between various stakeholders to, ha to help harmonize and uh, foster the discussions between uh, different, uh, different sci uh, scientists and scientific disciplines and stakeholders in this field. So there is a statement about funding and the conflict of interest. And we are at uh, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. So EBTC is governed by the uh, Board of Trustees uh, that also is striving to achieve the balance of uh, various stakeholders. And uh, we have a staff of uh, five uh, people um, who are all uh, listed here. And uh, the organizer of this seminar and uh, moderator is uh, Paul Whaley, who is EBTC research fellow and also is uh, at the University of Lancaster. So the EBTC uh, work is organized in two buckets. Uh, so it's the methodologies and uh, practical applications. The practical applications are systematic reviews that we're conducting and supervising. And we also work on, uh, on methodological issues of applying systematic reviews to the field of toxicology. So the systematic reviews in toxicology is ra rather new uh, and as you all know randomized controlled trials in toxicology are rarely possible for ethical reasons and uh, there is a very heterogeneous um, uh, evidence-based uh, evidence base in toxicology that includes various species of animals and uh, new uh, new scientific methods such as in vitro stem cells organ on chips um, and more and more in silicon computational methods so there are uh, new tools that are tailored to this type of evidence that are needed, and that's a big part of what we're working on. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So the, uh, the systematic review in environmental health really uh, has started um, uh, de developing in, uh, in mid to late uh, 2000s. And, and uh, Dr. Thomas Hartung, who is a, a uh, who is managing the uh, the department center of, of alternative uh, of of animal testing at Johns Hopkins and is a professor of evidence based toxicology at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health has convened the first international forum towards evidence based toxicology in 2007 in Como, Italy. Uh, in uh, and in 2011, uh, evidence based toxicology collaboration at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health has been started also by uh, Dr. Hartung. Uh, it's, uh, it's worth to note that in uh, 2010, the first uh, agency that started uh, using systematic reviews in their risk assessments is European Food Safety Authority. And uh, following that, there is a number of uh, uh, authorities that started uh, using this approach or uh, piloting using this approach, such as National Toxicology Program in 2014. And, uh, uh, the EPA started looking at using this approach in 2015. Um, the, in 2017, uh, EBTC has convened its stakeholders to write a primer on evidence-based reviews, on, on systematic reviews in toxicology. And, uh, and the same year, EFSA and EBTC conducted a colloquium on evidence integration in Lisbon. It's uh, the work that has been picked up by National Academy of Sciences that had uh, a workshop last year on evidence, on evidence integration in toxicological um, uh, research. So last year, uh, there were a few uh, workshops that EBTC has convened, which is the toxicology journal editors workshop uh, working on consensus statement on systematic reviews. And um, the, two, uh, the two other workshops that are directly related to today's topic are uh, the one that was that convened in Hamilton uh, last year, preceding the annual grade working group meeting, uh, where we had 34 people uh, participating, and then in small groups, uh, a small group discussion, over 100 people participating in the main grade meeting. There were four themes that were discussed uh, at this meeting, and this was, uh, as far as we know, this was the first time when the AOP community 
met with the systematic review community, which are very different universes, which was a very interesting discussion. In fact, we had so much fun that we decided to reconvene in uh, about three months in October in Parma and continue those discussions. So, and uh, that's, that's what really led to some of the collaborations and publications that have been, uh, that have started coming out from this work and that's what led to this discussion. So we just finished uh, the first session on incorporating of mechanistic data in uh, systematic reviews and environmental health this morning, which was very interesting. And I'm looking forward to the, uh, to this, uh, to the second, uh, to the current session. And I'm giving, and I'm on the wrong slide. Uh, and I'm giving the, uh, the floor to, to Paul. Lovely, thank you very much, Katia. Yes, so um, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, who is Dr. Frank Pegger, Technical Officer at the Department of Environment, Climate Change and Health at the World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva. And he's going to be talking to us about WHO experience in adapting the GRADE framework to assessing certainty of the evidence in systematic reviews of prevalence studies. Um, Frank, if you'd like to share your screen. And I will give you a three minute indicator by dinging this glass I have on my table, okay? Super, thank you so much. Okay, so please take it away. Okay, lovely. Well, first of all, thank you again, Paul, for this lovely introduction and also for, uh, to you and the organizers for inviting me to this session, which I'm very excited about. Okay, as Paul um, kindly introduced, I will talk about an approach that um, we have developed for assessing the quality or certainty of evidence and prevalence studies of um, exposure to occupational risk factors. And I noted the um, survey that was conducted just before and that many are interested in um, health risk assessment. And so I guess this approach that we are uh, proposing here, this emerging approach, is certainly very relevant to exposure assessment steps of this approach. Before I start off, I wanted to thank um, my colleagues at WHO who have also participated in this um, approach development, Susan Norris, who's online, and Richard Brown, who have both seen. But also I wanted to thank the WHO working group that has actively participated in this work, including Rebecca Morgan, who's online, and also Nicholas Chartres. Colleagues, in this presentation, I want to do the following things. I want to provide an overview of the WHO ILO joint estimates, estimates which are basically the motivator um, that got us to develop this emerging approach. I want to talk about the systematic reviews of prevalence studies in occupational health that we're conducting as the base for producing joint estimates, joint global health estimates with the International Labour Organization. And I will then quickly introduce the emerging QSBO approach, um, how it's developed based on grade and what its key three steps and components are before I finally draw some conclusions. Okay, what are the WHO ILO joint estimates? Well, the World Health Organization is the UN specialized agency responsible for health and the International Labor Organization is the specialized agency responsible for labor have decided in 2016 to join hands and for the first time develop joint estimates of the work-related burden of disease and injury. These are the WHO ILO joint estimates. This is very exciting because previously WHO and ILO developed estimates separately and there was some um, policy incongruence and that will be resolved by us producing joint estimates. As part of this process, we have as organizations um, decided to conduct 15 systematic reviews and meta-analyses that will basically provide um, the required input data and other evidence for producing these joint estimates. These are and will be published in, in a special issue in Environment International to which um, Paul Wiley is the handling editor, so we greatly appreciate that, that link and that support. Currently there are about about 200 individual experts in 35 countries who are actively participating in the development of these um, 15, the series of 15 systematic reviews. So it's a huge effort. And 
Specifically, it's, it's um, important to note that there are five systematic reviews that are being conducted on the prevalence of exposure to occupational risk factors. And these are, in, this, in essence, colleagues, the systematic views that I want to talk about today. Dr. Frank? Yes? I see your video is off now. Your connection is a little bit delayed. So just keep your video off. OK, thank you. Colleagues, first of all, um, it's important to note what we mean when we talk about prevalent studies of uh, occupational exposures or exposure to occupational risk factors. So prevalent studies are basically those that determine if an exposure is present or not. If the exposure to a specific risk factor, in our case occupational risk factor, is present or not in an individual of a study population at one point in time. So in essence, we're talking normally about cross-sectional um, capture of uh, an exposed, a specific exposure. So prevalence can then be <clears throat> calculated simply by dividing the number of exposed persons by the total number of persons in a specific study. And therefore, usually prevalence is reported as a percentage. So an example would be 85% of construction workers in a specific um, workplace setting in a particular country are exposed to, occupationally exposed to noise. What's important to notice, these prevalence studies, while they might seem quite banal and they're the basis of many, of many um, investigations and many surveys, they are actually um, quite different to studies of effects in the way that they, and one determining factor is basically that they can be highly heterogeneous. So it, uh, there can be a lot of variability in exposure to occupational risk factors, both within a specific worker or also between workers. For example, for construction workers, it's quite uh, imaginable and it's quite likely that a construction worker might be exposed to occupational noise uh, on one day, but not on the next. And also workers working in different occupations or different industrial sectors might have different levels of exposure to occupational noise. The WHO ILO systematic reviews of prevalence studies are listed here for you. As I mentioned before, we're currently conducting five of these, and you can see they basically concern a broad range of different occupational risk factors, ergonomic risk factors. We're looking at the prevalence and level of occupational exposure to three dusts and fibers, silica, asbestos, and coal dust. We're looking at exposure to solar ultraviolet radiation at the workplace, to occupational noise, and also to a psychosocial occupational risk factors, a risk factor which is long working hours. When we started developing the methods for these systematic reviews, we realized quickly that currently there seems to be no standard approach for assessing quality or certainty of evidence in these prevalence studies. So as um, an attempt to address this um, methodological gap, we started developing the QSPO approach. As I mentioned previously in the introduction, this is clearly based on the GRADE framework. We have um, looked through the standard downgrade domains of GRADE, and you will see shortly that we have adopted all five of those. We have looked to GRADE for any upgrade domains that might be relevant to assessing prevalence studies in occupational health but found that none of these were applicable, which I will talk about a little bit more in a second. We also realized that we, to, to assess certainty in prevalence studies in occupation health, we certainly needed a new step, uh, an upfront step, to assess what we coined as expected heterogeneity of exposure to an occupational risk factor. So something that, to our knowledge, uh, hasn't previously been done a lot in assessments of certainty of evidence. We then developed our uh, emerging approach. We have a document that basically outlines exactly the guides assessors through this approach. We pilot tested it uh, on one body of evidence from one of the WHO ILO systematic reviews, and then subsequently, in the absence of any other standard approach, applied it in our five systematic reviews. Let me quickly introduce the three steps of QSPO. First of all, we judge the level, or an assessor is asked to judge the level of expected heterogeneity, and I will show on the next slide how. Then 
we assess or each individual assessor assesses along downgrading domains. And then assessments of individual assessors are brought together to arrive jointly at a final decision, a final rating on the certainty of evidence across all involved assessors. Here's some more information on the first step to judge the expected, the so-called expected heterogeneity. The definition that we coined for expected heterogeneity is the variability that is real and non-spurious in the prevalence of exposure both within or between, well, either within or between workers or both, right? So it's sort of the idea behind it, especially that, uh, as I mentioned before, there could indeed quite likely be some heterogeneity um, within or between workers and that needed to be assessed first. And you see below how we are currently conceptualizing this. There are two, two, two questions that the assessor asks after being provided some considerations for how to assess. The first is where they are asked to say if they expect, reasonably expect the prevalence of the risk factor to be heterogeneous. You can see that there are two ratings, no or only minor expected heterogeneity or some heterogeneity expected. And then in the second step, in the second question, the assessor is asked to rate the actual level of heterogeneity, if there is any, from low, medium, or high as the three rating choices given. Then in the second step, um, this is probably what everybody is very familiar with, assessors assess along the five downgrade domains of grade, so they assess risk of bias in the entire body of evidence, indirectness, inconsistency, imprecision, and publication bias. I wanted to note that risk of bias um, assessments are based on a new tool that we've developed for assessing um, risk of bias in exactly this type of studies, studies estimating prevalence of exposure to occupational risk factors. So we now also have a tool at hand specifically tailored for occupational health assessments for risk of bias. Right? Another set um, of, of methods that we've developed specifically for our systematic reviews of prevalence studies. However, what's important to note is quite different is the assessment of downgrade domains or long downgrade domains with regards to the level of expected heterogeneity. So we consider the ratings from step one of expected heterogeneity now in step two, specifically for the domains of inconsistency, unsurprisingly, but also in precision. And colleagues down here, I note one specific example where assessments of inconsistency um, are different according to whether I have assessed the level of expected heterogeneity as low, or in this case here as moderate or high. So let's play it through. If an assessor has rated the level of expected heterogeneity as moderate or high, when they assess inconsistency in the total body of evidence, if they do find that the body of evidence is indeed quite homogeneous, then there might need to be um, a, there might be the need to downgrade because indeed we expected heterogeneity to be high. So we expected the body of evidence to be heterogeneous, but we found it to be homogeneous. So there might be some um, issue and, and our certainty might be reduced as a result of this. It's surprising. You have three minutes. Perfect. Okay, thank you. It's surprising because normally, of course, we wouldn't expect that. And also, similarly, if the body of evidence is indeed heterogeneous, as we have anticipated, then we wouldn't proceed to downgrading. Finally, um, the final decision, final writing on the quality of evidence across assessors is again very similar to um, what you used to in grade. So all assessors basically agree on one writing for each downgrade domain, and then jointly come to a final conclusion with the ratings here shown in the table. And you can see these, the explanations of the ratings are indeed very similar to those in grade, so moderately modified. Let me in time draw some final conclusion. WHO, uh, with the help of um, several individual experts that I mentioned up front, some of you are in the call today, thank you very much. We've jointly developed 
this emerging QSPO approach to assess prevalence studies of exposure to occupational risk factors based on the GRADE framework. As I outlined, QSPO has three steps. We assess expected heterogeneity, we downgrade along uh, the GRADE domains, GRADE downgrade domains, and we reach a final decision with all assessors by consensus. The innovative features of QSPO are listed here again. So there is an upfront assessment of what we have coined expected heterogeneity, it's unusual. And then also assessments of selected downgrade domains are essentially based on the level of expected heterogeneity. And also colleagues, thirdly, there are no upgrade domains in QSPO. Finally, just to note that QSPO has been pilot tested. It has been used already in WHO's and ILO's five systematic reviews of prevalence studies, but clearly it's an emerging approach. It's sort of at the proof of concept stage or perhaps a little bit more than that and requires further development and testing. And colleagues, with this, I would like to thank you very much again and look forward to questions. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much, Frank. Um, I don't see any questions yet in the question and answer panel. So if any participants do have questions, uh, you can ask them through the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom display. Uh, so I guess I get to ask a question. So Frank, um, could you just clarify a little bit more the role that existing grade working group members have had in developing the QOE SPE approach? And then maybe what plans you might have in future for maybe integrating the grade working group perhaps into further development of this because it is a new concept and an adaptation of the grade framework so it'd be interesting to hear about that right thank you very much paul well um i have to admit that i'm not 100 percent um, familiar with the membership of the grade working group but i i believe that rebecca is is uh, one of you so um rebecca morgan's certainly been involved um Paul, we've benefited from some editorial feedback, quite a lot of very helpful editorial feedback from you already in the process of looking at publishing this, this approach and how it was developed. But um, the, I should talk about the WHO uh, advisory group that we've put together on methods, systematic review methods for occupational health, because we know there's a, a gap of a methodologists specifically focusing on occupational health. And this is a group that's um, formed and has about 30 members at this point, including many members perhaps that overlap with membership of, of your group. And um, we look forward to continuing to improve this tool over time. And that membership is essentially uh, you know, open and, and by invitation. So we look forward to engaging further with others who, who are also interested in this approach. Super, thank you very much, Frank. All right, so we'll go on to our next presenter now, or presenters, I should say. So I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Elizabeth Radke and Dr. Aaron Yost, who are epidemiologists and toxicologists, respectively, working at the Center for Public Health and Environmental Assessment at the US Environmental Protection Agency. And they are going to be talking to us about the experience of uh, the US EPA IRIS program approach to assessing certainty of the evidence as conducted in the recent systematic reviews of human health effects of exposure to phthalates. So I think uh, Aaron and Beth, I'm gonna hand it over to you now. If you could start sharing a screen, Aaron, and I think Beth is going to be the first speaker in this uh, sort of two person presentation. Beth, I think you're still on mute. Oh, can you hear me now? Can I hear you yeah. now, yes. Hello? You can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. So you didn't hear anything that I said in phone, right? <laughs> All right, sorry. I muted, unmuted my phone, uh, but not to Zoom. Okay, so thank you uh, for the invitation. We're, we're really happy to to join you today. Um, Aaron and I are both part of the IRIS program at EPA, and we're gonna try to give you a very quick overview of our systematic review approach, as well as some examples of applying it to both in, um, epidemiology and animal toxicology studies. Um, I do wanna note um, that the IRIS program has been in a period of 
very fast evolution of our systematic review methods over the last few years. So some of the details of how we specifically approach things may be different um, now than they were when we did these systematic reviews, but the overall process is the same. We just keep refining all the time. So we're happy to get into more detail uh, and questions, or you can reach out to us at the leader. So to start with, um, uh, you can go to the next slide, Erin. Uh, I'll just give some background on phthalates. Um, so phthalates are diesters of phthalic acid. And they're used in many, many consum consumer products, and thus uh, exposure is ubiquitous across the life stages. Um, basically, all humans, when if they are tested, will um, have detectable levels of, of phthalates in their in their body. Um, so we were working on uh, assessments of essentially all the health effects of phthalates, but today we're going to focus on just a couple of male reproductive outcomes. Um, there's a lot more work that's described in a special issue of Environment Internet International that um, has been published sort of piecemeal over the last couple of years. And we have a list of all those papers at the end of the presentation if you want to dig into more detail about what we're talking about. So on the next slide, um, to very quickly summarize what we do after the literature search and screening step, uh, we go through a domain-based study evaluation with two independent re uh, reviewers and come to consensus ratings for um, for each domain, which you can see on the top table there, both for animal studies and epidemiology studies, we have slightly different domains. Um, and then uh, for overall study confidence based on those domains. And um, both the domain ratings and the overall confidence ratings feed directly into our evidence synthesis, which is the next step. So um, on the next slide, um, our, our approach for evidence synthesis is adapted from the, the Bradford Hill considerations. So separately for human and animal evidence, we analyze each of the considerations that you see here. Um, so we think about consistency, effect magnitude and precision, biological gradient or the dose response that's observed in the study, coherence across related um, outcomes. And then for epidemiology evidence, we also think about natural experiments if they are available, not that often, but sometimes, and temporality. And then we also think about mechanistic evidence within each of these two streams um, if, if, it, if it's relevant to assessing these considerations. There are other steps where we also think about mechanistic evidence. So on the next slide, um, we have some more detail about how each of the considerations um, contributes to our judgment about the strength of evidence. Um, so for example, um, for consistency, if we have the similar results in different studies and different populations or different species for animal studies, that would increase our confidence that there is actually an association. And for each of these considerations, we think about um, high and medium confidence studies receiving more weight. So consistent high and medium confidence studies um, increases our strength more than, uh, than low confidence studies. I don't have time to go through all of these, but uh, we have detail here and can provide more later if needed. Um, so on the next slide, uh, we really think of the strength of the evidence as sort of a continuum from you know, really the evidence is inadequate to draw any kind of solid judgment up to, you know, the strongest possible evidence that, that we could have um, that supports an effect. Uh, and so we have a structured framework to determine the strength of, of the evidence. So if you click once more, uh, Aaron, for example, the strongest evidence would be a set of consistent higher medium confidence studies where we've reasonably ruled out other possible explanations like bias or chance. And any studies that conflict are, are weaker or we have an explanation for why um, the results are different. And there's also some extra strength coming from, you know, a clear dose response evidence um, in humans that's observed across populations. There's also other lines of support for animal studies like the MLA. And then from there, if you click again, you can see, you know, we go down the, the strength of evidence. And it's even possible for us to get to, you know, there's really, there's strong evidence that there is no effect. We don't see that very often in our assessments, but we do um, realize that there is a possibility of that. So um, we have had a lot of discussion at EPA about what to call these different levels. Um, that's still an, an ongoing discussion, but for the purposes of the papers that we're um, talking about today, um, if you click once more, we have, these are the terms that we're using. We're using robust for that top um, strongest category uh, down to indeterminate for there's really inadequate evidence to, to make any kind of conclusion. 
And I did want to note that we considered using grade um, instead of the, uh, you know, rather than creating our own framework. Um, and we do like, we like the structured approach of grade, but in, a, in applying it, we found some pressure points in, in doing the upgrades and the downgrades for this type of evidence. So we, we opted to develop our own structured framework. We found it worked very well for us over the last few years, but we're, we're always, we're always, as I said before, working on refinement. Okay, so then um, go to the next slide. So normally in the iris process, we would then, um, from, with, from the within stream um, conclusions for human and animal evidence, we would go on to integrate, uh, integrate those streams and also bring in the mechanistic evidence on human relevance of the animal findings and susceptibility and coherence across the streams. We weren't able to do that for these papers, so I'm not going to go into it any, any more here. So next uh, slide. Okay, now I'm going to go through an example of applying this framework to the epidemiology evidence for anogenital distance and two phthalates, DEHP and DIBP. You can go to the next slide. Uh, the, the literature search was very broad intentionally to capture basically any population, any outcome, any comparator with one of these six phthalates um, that are listed at the top. And um, on the next slide, you can see that we identified uh, 100 studies with uh, male reproductive effects. And on the next slide, you'll see the six studies that uh, had anogenital distance measures and exposure measured in urine, which we consider to be the most valid exposure measurement for, for phthalates. Um, so on the heat map, you can see our, our individual domain readings as well as the overall confidence. And you can see that there, all six of the studies measured uh, DEHP metabolites. Three of them measured DIBP metabolites. Three were considered medium confidence, and three were low confidence studies. Okay, next slide. So looking at DEHP, um, the medium confidence studies are on the figure, and all of the studies are in the table. And uh, we can see that the three medium confidence studies all showed an inverse association between the sum of DEHP metabolites and anogenital distance. They're not all statistically significant, and it, you know um, the confidence interval for Borna Hug at all 2015 is very wide, um, so there's some uncertainty there. But uh, we do see this sort of exposure response gradient across the studies, um, where um, the studies, as the exposure levels within the population increases, so does the effect estimate. Um, and the low confidence studies, also two of the three of those also observed in inverse association. So then on the next slide that we sort of pull all of this together, um, and you can see we have, similar to grade, we have factors that increase our strength and decrease our strength, but it's a little bit less um, rigid, I, I guess I would say. And so, um, and the factors that increase our strength we have, uh, and these are driven um, as much as possible. They're tied to the health considerations that I talked about before. We have consistency among the medium confidence studies. There's the exposure response gradient across the studies. We have minimal concerns for bias. These are well-conducted studies. Whereas on, uh, on the factors of decreased strength, we have low precision in that one study uh, with the largest effect size. So taking all that together, we're considering this to be moderate um, evidence of an association between DEHP exposure and anogenital distance in these, in these studies. And then in the paper that you'll see, we then also went up to the male reproductive um, uh, conclusion. Okay, and then on the next slide, um, just looking at DIBP very quickly, um, this gives a different picture because we have only three studies. Two of them are medium confidence. One of them was essentially null, and one showed a non-statistically significant inverse association, as, and so did the, the low confidence study. And so if we go to the next slide, we see this the table again where, you know, really there's inconsistency across the medium confidence studies that decreases our strength. There really aren't many studies at all um, for us to be able to probe that inconsistency and see if there are, are reasons for it um, that we can explain. And so while there is some indication that there's maybe an association, it's, we're calling it slight evidence. Um, okay, and so now I think on the next slide, I'm handing it over to Aaron Yost to, to go through an example with um, animal toxicology studies. Thank you so much. Okay, can you guys hear me? 
Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay, great. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm going to show an example from animal toxicology. And so this is from our paper that was a systematic review of health effects of DIBP exposure, um, just looking at animal toxicology studies. Okay, uh, so again, similar to the epi studies, we did a very broad literature search focusing just on DIBP. And um, we looked at six different health outcomes that have been commonly associated with phthalate exposure. Um, but for this presentation, I'll just focus on the male reproductive effects. And um, so basically we found over a thousand studies. We narrowed that down to um, 20 that met our criteria. Um, for inclusion, um, 16 of those looked at male reproductive effects and a subset of those looked at effects on testosterone. So that's what I'll be focusing on in the next slides is how we synthesize the data for testosterone. Um, so this slide shows a summary of the study designs and the study evaluation results for the animal studies that looked at um, some measure of testosterone in males. So I've, you can see I've got these divided up into gestational exposure studies and postnatal exposure studies. So the gestational studies were any studies that looked at effects in F1 males from mothers that had been exposed to DIVP during gestation. And then the postnatal exposure studies were studies that looked at exposures in young males. Um, so you can see the gestational exposure studies, if you look at those first, um, we didn't have many concerns about them. We, we gave them good ratings across most domains with some adequates mixed in. Um, the one exception, you can see the study by Wong et al. and mice uh, had a deficient rating for its results presentation, and that's due to, um, uh, they showed their data for the F1 male pups as an average of individual pups, which is something that's been shown to potentially increase um, the significance of the results. Um, so we do consider that a concern for bias. We, uh, but otherwise that study was pretty good. We had few concerns. So that was the medium confidence rating overall, high confidence for the rest. Um, looking down at the postnatal exposure studies, you can see that we had more concerns about those. Um, so for example, one concern for bias would be that they didn't provide any information about their allocation of test animals to experimental groups. And that's something that has been empirically shown to um, potentially bias your results in favor of seeing an effect. So that's one concern for bias. Um, one concern for sensitivity in the postnatal studies is that it appeared from the description of the test animals that the animals may have already started puberty before the study began. Um, so that's something that might reduce the sensitivity to effects on hormones. So. Um, and then one study had a concern for results presentation. So we ended up giving those medium confidence ratings for three studies, low confidence for one. Um, uh, Aaron, you've got two minutes, but if you like, I can give you three just because uh, you do have a slightly longer presentation and we're doing reasonable on time. So. Oh, great. Yeah, three minutes. Okay. Good. Thanks. Okay, so we do, uh, we do try to synthesize data separately for different life stages of exposure when we have data available, and that's because um, we want to account for potential differences in susceptibility across life stages. And that's something that's especially true for things like hormonal effects, where you can have very specific windows of exposure and sensitivity. Um, so since we had these two data sets available, that's how we approached it for the animal studies. So this is showing first the data for testosterone after gestational exposure. You can see that across the studies in rats and mice, we had a very consistent decrease in testosterone with exposure. Um, and in the studies that had multiple doses tested, there was a dose response gradient with increasing effect with dose. Um, so here's our evidence profile table that brings the data together for gestational exposure. Um, some factors that increased the strength was that consistency across studies and across species dose response gradient, uh, a very large effect size in some cases, up to 96% decrease compared to controls. There was support for biological plausibility from mechanistic data um, because some of the studies also reported gene expression data in the testis of the fetal mouse where they showed that there was decreased expression of steroidogenic genes with exposure. So that supports biological plausibility. And then, and as I mentioned earlier, minimum concerns for bias and sensitivity. So overall, we consider that to be robust evidence for effects after gestational exposure. Um, moving on to postnatal, these results were more all over the place. Um, so for the two studies in mice, one saw no effect, one saw a decrease in testosterone. Um, in rats, there was a general trend towards increased testosterone. So conflicting results 
across species. So our evidence profile table that pulls data together for the postnatal exposures. Um, a factor that increases strength is that there is that biological plausibility for effects in testosterone, as we've seen with that gestational exposure data. Um, but decreasing the strength is that unexplained inconsistency across studies, both within the species and across species, as well as the concerns for bias and sensitivity um, that, that may have explained some of those differences in results. So our conclusion for the postnatal exposure studies was that there is indeterminate evidence um, uh, for effects on testosterone, since we couldn't conclude either way uh, what the effects seemed to be in those animals. And if you look at the paper, um, we do also come to a conclusion for male reproductive effects overall, um, which we do consider there to be a robust evidence that DIBP is a male reproductive toxin based, based mostly on that gestational exposure data. Well, thanks, Aaron. Um, if you could just uh, look towards wrapping up now, we're just running a bit short on time. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, lastly, just a plug for our special issue. We just, we just finished publication uh, of the series of papers in Environment International that covers uh, the gamut of methods and systematic reviews um, uh, for, for our phthalates project. So we encourage you guys to check that out if you want to see some more information on this project. And I'll wrap it up. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Aaron and Beth. That was really interesting. Um, and I don't just say that because I happen to edit these systematic reviews. Um, <clears throat> I should probably actually just clarify that whilst a lot of the research here is being presented, has been published in Environment International. Uh, we've chosen these presenters not because of the journal, but because we've got two probably the largest environmental health systematic review projects which have been undertaken just happen to both be being completed at the same time. So it's just very good timing for this kind of webinar. Um, Beth, I think I have a quick question for you, which we'll probably circle back to in the panel discussion. But you talked about um, there being a few pressure points when it comes to applying grade uh, in environmental health systematic reviews for US EPA. And I was just wondering what sort of pressure points those might be if you felt comfortable maybe clarifying what they are. Uh, well, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, a lot of this is um, from a lot of discussion within our group and not just specific to the epidemiology evidence, but for the toxicology in particular. And so I, uh, part of it is the, is the rigidity of having to downgrade and not upgrade for the same, um, for the same factors. And uh, we, I, you know, I know that some of our group had some issues with, with, the indirectness, and so I, you know, we can certainly get into more detail about what that looked like, but I, you know, I know we don't have a ton of time. So. That's very interesting. Yeah, I think we're just kind of more queuing up an issue for uh, further discussion a bit. So, uh, what we'll do now is we'll go to our final presenter before we then return to Holger and Rebecca for comments from a great perspective. So, I'm very pleased to introduce German Cano Sancho. And I'm going to have to dust off my French here. He is chargé de recherche at the Laboratoire d'études de résidus et contaminants dans les aliments at the École Nationale Vétérinaire, Agroalimentaire et d'Alimentation, uh, or NIRIS, in Nantes in France. Um, he will be speaking on his experience in integrating mechanistic data and use of the National Toxicology Program Office of Health Assessment Translation Certainty Framework in systematic reviews of the effect of organochlorine exposure on risk of endometriosis. So, German, if you'd like to show your slides. Thanks, Paul. Uh, can you hear me well? I can hear you very well indeed. That's perfect. Thank you so much for your nice presentation in French. It's excellent. <laughs> I'm going to share. So thanks very much also for the rest of organizing team to let us uh, the opportunity to share our experience on systematically integrate uh, the evidence on endometriosis and organochlorine and chemicals. First of all, I would like to say that I don't have a conflict of interest on, on this research 
we are fu uh, fully funded by uh, public uh, organizations and we don't participate on regulatory decision making. We are independent uh, scientific uh, units that provide uh, independent research. So what's endometriosis? Uh, actually, nobody knows uh, very well what's endometriosis, but we know that touch a lot of uh, women uh, worldwide in reproductive age. And it's characterized by the presence of uh, endometrial tissue outside the ut uterine cavity that uh, particularly keeps uh, the estrogenic uh, reactivity during the hormonal cycles and that causes a lot of pain uh, to women and that's very dramatic impact on, uh, on the well-being of, of women. Many factors has been associated to the mobility of cells, including a retrograde menstruation, but other factors has been also associated to implantation of uh, the endometrial lesions, including the environmental pollutants. That was the reason that brought us to conduct a preliminary study in France, a case control study, where we were able to find uh, most of organochlorine chemicals like pesticides, dioxins, or, or PCBs, banned in the 70s, were all found on all women that were uh, uh, Missouri in 2016. We also established uh, associations with the most severe cases and that substantiated my research program to develop uh, a novel approach uh, in, in combining metabolomic and exposomic uh, platforms in order to gain insight on the biological links in between the exposure and endometriosis prevalence. To do that, uh, we conceive an evidence-based framework in order to gather and substantiate the prioritization criteria of chemicals and biomarkers uh, of the, that novel approach. So we conceive a uh, epidemiological systematic review and also a systematic review on experimental studies that I will expand a little bit more. In the first uh, systematic review, we applied uh, ntp ohat approach to evaluate the risk of bias and the level of evidence because it's a framework that I'm more familiar with. And we, uh, end up with 17 uh, studies that mostly were positively associated with uh, endometriosis, either dioxins, PCBs, or pesticides. And we were surprised of the heterogeneity of uh, the different biomarkers used, especially many uh, of them were using uh, serum biomarkers that entails a uh, um, model specification issue related to the uh, specific phenotype of lipid perturbation that is underlying the, the pathology of endometriosis. Well, overall, we conclude that uh, there is a, a positive association, but we highlighted the level of uh, evidence was moderate based on the OHAT uh, framework with serious risk of bias, especially associated to the selection bias that it's a limitation of endometriosis research because most of the studies were conducted in clinical settings. And there is a, a true difficulty of finding a, a confirmed control population. And also the population-based research is lacking in, in the body of evidence. Also, most of the studies were case control studies, so we could not rule out a high risk of uh, reverse causation that could explain the high level of, of, of uh, organochlorines. So this further stimulated our need to conduct a systematic review on experimental studies that basically we extend the protocol towards the in vivo and in vitro models so we developed the protocol that was published last year and we developed the PICO statement also considering all organochlorine chemicals in a broad way because we show that uh, 
those chemicals are very tightly correlated in human specimens, so we cannot isolate one of them. And the other thing is that we are not uh, providing a systematic review for a uh, regulatory framework that uh, all of chemicals are banned. So we are mostly interested to gather the evidence to better understanding the underlying uh, uh, pathways and establish a robust uh, conclusion on the causation links. So about the outcomes, we were inspired by the AOP framework and the key characteristic framework for carcinogens in order to identify different uh, experimental outcomes that are very used on endometriosis. So I should highlight the complexity of experimental research of endometriosis because it's a very complex disease to study in animals that only happen in primates. So we find that onset of, uh, of uh, endometriosis only might be evaluated in very strict models. And other outcomes include the measurement of uh, growing lesions that are implanted in, in rodents or in vitro uh, models that are following up the migration capacity of cells. We also consider the, the proliferation uh, outcome as a basic uh, uh, endpoint to keep the endometriotic uh, tissue alive and growing. In the middle, we consider a list of intermediary outcomes that might help us to establish the links between the exposures and the apical outcomes, including the gene markers uh, or uh, cytokines uh, related with uh, inflammation, also the perturbation of esterogenesis or progesterone resistance, among others. The workflow follow a NTPO hat approach that was managed by Hawk, where we use for syn synthesis and also to, to manage the risk of bias assessment. And uh, we then conducted the evaluation of the level of evidence. I will show you some preliminary results. You should take into account that it's not published yet, so some might be uh, modified later on, but I would like uh, sharing with you some of the features that uh, we found and the methodology we use to display the results. I will focus mainly on TCDD, that it's one of the most reported uh, chemical. So to date we have compiling 17 in vivo studies and 24 in vitro studies. And this is an example uh, displayed by Hawk where we display in a qualitative way the direction of, of the effect. This is in the case of the onset or incidence of endometriosis or endometriotic-like uh, phenotypes. We have three studies on TCDD that were showing a consistent increase and one on PCV that was not associated with endometriosis. The second apical endpoint is the lesion of growth that was pretty consistent at the higher doses of TCDD and at the lower doses was not associated with the growth of the lesion in most rodent models evaluated. When we see the other um, OCCs, we found a very inconsistent results. In some cases there is an association, other not, but interestingly in the case of the most uh, uh, toxic uh, PCV in terms of uh, the dioxin-like activity, we find some consistency with uh, TCDD. The proliferation also exhibit a very conflicting results, either on TCDD that was not consistent at all and the rest of chemicals, but was in opposite direction of uh, migration or invasion in, in cells that was very consistent across the different chemicals and in TCDD. Interestingly, in the lower dose of TCDD, we found consistent interaction of TCDD with estradiol. So for the primary outcomes, we move the framework to evaluate the risk of bias, considering the NTPO had a tool adapted to a specific research question where we classify in the entire 
approach in the different uh, level of, of risk of bias. So we consider serious uh, risk of bias in the case of onset because some of studies lack of reporting a very important information and was classified in the lower tier. In the case of growth lesion, we consider not likely not to downgrade. In the case of invasiveness in vitro, uh, we, consider, uh, we consider also a serious risk of bias to downgrade the confidence. And similarly, also for the proliferation uh, outcome. I will also highlight the analysis of directness or indirectness in that case. In the case of the exposure doses, in the upper part, you can see the panel of uh, doses from epidemiological studies highlighted the higher dose study that from the Seves uh, accident, that it's far from the rat studies or the, or the rodent studies in the lower panel that are some log scale for higher. So here we consider penalizing and downgrading the, the evidence of uh, growth lesion in animals because they high those use. So this is the summary table we, we use to have uh, the level of evidence for the different bodies of evidence. And we can see most of them were finally classified as moderate. And the case of invasiveness was compensated by the high consistency across the study and keep at high level of evidence. We further uh, continue displaying the different nodes of uh, endpoints connected in between them with what we so call as an evidence network using a key arrow for connecting in case of positive associations and using the size of the arrow for the level of evidence. This to help us to establish the connection between chemicals and the different endpoints. And in this case, I emphasize the interaction of estrogen with the a connecting knot with uh, invasiveness in vitro. We do the same for the intermediary outcomes, and we can identify here some AOP-like uh, framework, but it's not that complex, but it's giving us some example of uh, connecting arrows between some intermediary events like uh, the inflammation that was the most important uh, body of evidence that was supporting the relationship with uh, inflammation and invasiveness or in vitro and in vivo. The same for the case of the MPPs that were associated either with TCDD alone or also TCDD with uh, estradiol in the interaction term. And uh, the ex that it's a marker of uh, matrix remodelation, and it's a marker also of invasiveness in vitro and in vivo. So we are extending. Oh, and you have just two minutes left, okay? Okay, that's perfect. We are on time. So we have uh, confirmed this uh, this uh, network of genes and markers with also the analysis of comparative toxicogenomic database, where we end up with uh, 155 genes on the connecting nodes between TCDD and endometriosis that, as we can see, are overlapping nodes on uh, endometriosis, uh, perturbation of esterogenesis, or uh, genes associated with the adhesion of uh, molecules. Also, we can emphasize the overlapping uh, genes between TCD, estradiol, and progesterone, as we have emphasized. To, to finish, I want to thank the huge work of Komodo that is uh, today here with me, that has been doing the most of the work, and the rest of uh, of our team and the gynecologists participating in the systematic review and the toxicologist. Okay, that's all for me. If you have any question, I will be very happy to answer you. Brilliant, thank you, Sherman. Um, I don't have any immediate clarificatory questions. Oops. So what I might do in order to keep things moving forward is if um, I invite Rebecca and Holger to provide their responses. So uh, 
Holger Schunemann is a Professor of Clinical Epidemiology and Medicine, Director of Cochrane Canada and the McMaster Grade Centre. And Rebecca Morgan is Assistant Professor in the Department for Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. Um, they're going to be providing their thoughts, questions and observations from their perspective as uh, inventors, developers and um, methodologists working with the GRADE framework and with systematic review. Holger, you're still on mute. Oh, what an amateurish mistake, but it happens all the time, I think. Anyways, thanks, Paul. Um, uh, I'm great to be here and um, I'm very glad to participate. We, as we said before, the idea was to see how these sessions and how, how the um, EBTC work um, fits into or fits with with great how the relation um, um, works or how other frameworks connect to to great and I will just offer a few general thoughts. We will not provide any details on great really because that's probably not uh, um, both in the in the um, on the intention of the of the organizers as well um, as not um, possible in the in with the time available. But the so just a general um, issue, and you alluded to that in your in your question, I think to to Frank, um, which relates to how great operates. And um, great is an open working group that uh, um, is has over the last twenty years really tried to move methods forward um, through open dialogue and and also looking at at um, potential criticism application as well as um, um, fixes of, of grade in a, in a way that um, um, has then led to advancement. And, and one of the, uh, I think one of the, the fortunate, um, um, you know, outcomes has been that we've developed meetings that take place twice a year in a way that um, those who work on grade related issues in particular, if they um, use the great framework and try to modify it or base something on it to actually bring bring that work forward for a full um, discussion with with great um, working group members that is obviously you know who have many many more opinions than the than the, or interpretations or connections than the two that Rebecca and I can offer here so I think that's really important so thinking of um, Frank's prevalence um, um, work and you you already mentioned that I think it would be great Right to to um, look at this in the in the context of a a great um, prevalence project group where I'm sure um, additional thoughts um, could be quite helpful. So, for instance, how to operationalize some certain certain areas, and in particular because there has been work on prevalence taking place by Maicon um, Falavinia, um, who who has supplied great in the context of of prevalence um, prevalence studies. And provided some, you know, at least some initial initial um, um, guidance. So, so that would be extremely. I think that would be extremely helpful to um, um, to to bring these groups together, um, ideally in the in a great project um, work. So, so that by by introduction. But I, I had a very specific question, if I if I did understand it correctly, and that had to do with the expected heterogeneity so one of the one of the, the ways that that great as i said has has worked is um through operationalization of the judgments on the individual domain domains and and i wonder i wondered um frank if you if i understood it correctly if you could allude if you could um describe the difference between um, um expected uh, heterogeneity explained heterogeneity and unexplained heterogeneity, if you have any thoughts on that, because it, it looked like, like something that um, um, is, is not in the, in the great lingo. And, and I, wonder, I just wanted to understand that a little, a little bit better. If that's something else from, if that's something different than an unexplained heterogeneity for which we would be or we, we might be rating down once again if we cannot explain the heterogeneity that might be wrong if we can explain heterogeneity we would um, produce subgroup in this case um, analysis so that's my that's my first question perhaps
Okay, I guess, um, yes, that's, that's to me to respond straight away, I guess. So, um, Holger, thank you very much for that um, analysis and these thoughts. And it's lovely to also meet you because you've been involved in providing some methodological guidance also to our set of systematic reviews. So it's lovely to actually be in touch like this. And I think you raised some really important points. So this um, idea of expected heterogeneity, I thought of it as very specific to prevalence studies, right? Because in prevalence studies, it's quite, um, you know, in many ways, if you're exposed to some risk factors occupationally, then as I mentioned before, it would be expected that there would be heterogeneity not only between workers, but also across workers within occupational groups, within industrial sectors and so on. So when we came to the concept of expected heterogeneity, basically we arrived to it from the idea that when we use exposure data in burden of disease studies, we wouldn't necessarily be less certain of use of these data in a, from a systematic review, which of course there aren't many, right? It's surprising that prevalence studies are not commonly systematically reviewed and they're no standard methods. So it's sort of, it's an obvious huge gap, which also means that there's no such methods for exposure assessment. But anyway, so when we started to think about prevalence studies in, to, of exposure to risk factors, it became apparent that often it hasn't been made transparent if um, assessors thought that this heterogeneity that occurred was actually to be, you know, if, if you found heterogeneity, would that actually make sense? So would we expect it in the first place? So by adding an upfront um, assessment of expected heterogeneity, we would basically, you know, force raters to be very clear on does this occupational risk factor, exposure to this risk factor vary or not? And then based on that, of course, we can we can go and assess um, imprecision and, and inconsistency. So I think in many ways you're right, explained and unexplained heterogeneity, these were the two concepts you asked me to relate to expected heterogeneity. I guess expected heterogeneity would be an upfront assessment without having seen the data too well of, you know, as an expert judging if I would anticipate there to be lots of variability in exposure to this risk factor or not. And so later on, if I was to find a high level of heterogeneity, then, you know, this would be explained, right? This would be according to what we expected. So I guess that's the link to expand heterogeneity. And if we find the opposite, it would be unexplained heterogeneity, but it's a bit more complicated once you start thinking through the various options that you can have. So what you can see in this approach is that basically for inconsistency and for imprecision, we have two different sets of considerations based on the level of expected heterogeneity for our assessments. Right. So the most obvious is that if we find high levels of heterogeneity in uh, a prevalence study of exposure to an occupational risk factor, then when we come to assess um, inconsistency, in many ways, you know, it's sort of a little bit counterintuitive that high heterogeneity would then not lead to a downgrading, right? Because normally, I guess, high heterogeneity almost always leads to a downgrade, right? So I think what, what, we, what we do with this additional step is basically just give full transparency from the beginning an upfront assessment of whether we expect heterogeneity, how we expect heterogeneity to, to behave. Yeah. I don't know if that's enough, but yeah. Well, yeah, no, so thanks, um, thanks Frank for, for, for that answer. I think it's a really, it's a really important topic and, and we have a little bit of, of time. It's one of the issues that came up um, um, that, that uh, I think relates to um, heterogeneity or inconsistency um, throughout many different types of assessments, the principles are are always similar. That's why it might might be worthwhile spending some time on it. So, because one way of thinking about it is um, what you, if you think of expected heterogeneity, that's essentially what you put into your protocol, right? You would say, okay, um, here are a few subgroups of the population, combinations of groups, some um, combinations of exposures and populations, um, where we might see. Uh, where, we, where we suspect there will be differences. These are our limited number as we typically do it because if you come up with an unlimited number of explanations, that's also not that, <laughs> that, that uh, helpful. Here's our, our, the, the number of um, um, factors that or, or um, variables that we will utilize to explore any arising heterogeneity. The way that we would typically do this also in prognosis studies that are very similar to prevalence studies, right? Um, uh, would be through these, through these assumptions and we would then say, okay, if any of these 
any of these um, uh, um, subgroups indeed do explain the heterogeneity, then we do present the results separately, which is essentially what you're saying. You then do an, an assessment. So there's explained heterogeneity. Explained heterogeneity leads typically to a subgroup analysis. Um, and in that subgroup, you would assess inconsistency, imprecision, and even indirectness separately um, um, because you have explained the heterogeneity. So I just wanted to confirm whether or not um, um, that seems to be congruent. It seems to me that it is indeed completely congruent with how we would have looked at, at um, um, heterogeneity, um, just that you call that expected heterogeneity, which is one term that one can use, I think, or you utilize it in a in a protocol type of approach, right? This is what we know before we start the work. Here is what we expect um, might explain the heterogeneity, right? Um, uh, um, it is not always the case because you, also that is an important finding, right? Because our suspicion may be quite different from what we what we see, and then we would um, um, go into these um, into these uh, into the subgroups. Is that is that an appropriate con um, characterization, or is there still something different? I think there's. I mean, it's very interesting, and I, I really like how you relate these concepts. And we struggled a long time with giving expected heterogeneity its name, right? But um, I think it it goes beyond just heterogeneity within subgroups. So it could be that one specific um, occupation risk factor exposure could be just always heterogeneous across or could could be always variable across all occupations do you know what i mean it, it could be it could be always for example if you think about occupation exposure to noise um, it could be variable across all workers right i mean there are different levels of noise so in, in many ways it wouldn't only be within one subgroup but it would be across all all populations that we'd be looking at um, sure. so but but it's definitely sort of a very interesting concept to compare it with with expand and un well, the one thing is, yeah, so like the... yeah, yeah. I guess the one thing is that we know there will be differences, but the problem, the the, the issue is when does it matter, right? And that's when you start your subgroup analysis. So you, there's always like in any drug trial, you know, people are not taking their 81 milligrams aspirin every day, really, right? They skip a few days. So there is always the question is how does it actually. How does it? Uh, is there actually any any way of categorizing this? So so um, um, okay, I I'm, uh, Frank. I'm just going to move on because of the interest of time. So and and probably very helpful to have a, have more in depth some conversation. I will maybe ask one other question and then turn it over to to Rebecca. And um, I wanted to so move from from Frank um, if that's if that's okay. To uh, to Beth and I think it was it was Beth who alluded to that. So, so the the you you mentioned the um, certainty of evidence or quality of evidence, strength of evidence is a continuum, which um, is what we've you know what what is completely also completely consistent with with um, how great um, looks at certainty of evidence, right? It's a continuum, and we are trying to categorize it mainly for communication and because. We, you know, expressing it in a different way might uh, imply false precision, right? If we were not, if we were indeed trying to explain it as a as a as a continuum, the categorization probably just helps with um, dealing with some of the imprecision around the assessment of the certainty. But um, so, in the matrix that has always that has always um, uh, intrigued me that. And I understand that we are coming from hazard from the hazard um, assessment uh, um, um, point of view, but there is this ace, there is this asymmetry between um, robust evidence for an effect and having only one category that says um, compelling evidence of no effect is as opposed to as opposed to also for no effects um, having other types of judgments, other types of categories that um, um, could be could be utilized. Um, in other words, um, you know, if you look at quantitative estimates, uh, um, their your best estimate may be that there is no effect, but for various reasons, the research is not good enough. Um, the research is imprecise. You know, you you might want to say 
that there is no that there is no effect that's still your best estimate but you cannot be fully confident as opposed to having the way the, um, the evidence cert the certainty rating in the in the way that you do it any reflections any comments on that is that not as as important or does everything when you don't have compelling evidence uh, um, for for no effect because of precautionary principles move into the category of possibly being a hazard yeah thanks i think that's a great question i i, I do think this has to do uh with our mission at the epa and as you said the and best can maybe can yeah maybe you can show that is it possible for you to show that slide because i I, uh, I'm afraid that I that I may have caught many listeners of of guard, and we are not relate. You know, they may not recall the the slide. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, uh, Short that yeah. so. Well. Let me see if I can do it. Or, or you, you, Aaron, you should be able to share your screen. I think you should still have that ability. I can share. Thank you. So you know, I. I our um, our mission at the EPA is primarily protective, and so uh, we are we are interested in determining whether there is a hazard from these chemicals. And um, can you just let so, me know which one I should go to? Yeah, um, it's uh, it would be slide five. Try that. Uh, do you see it? Yeah, go slide six, I guess. Slide six, I think it is. Yeah. Yes, there we go. Yep, and and then just go forward, uh, just click twice. This one? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> so. Um, you know, we, we do think it's important to be able to state when there is, you know, a clear body of evidence that shows that there is no effect. But if the, in situations where we aren't able to come to that conclusion, um, functionally, there's not much difference. You know, if there's, if there's additional information that could potentially get us into there being an effect, we don't want to say that there's no effect, right? So, um, Anything where it, where there wasn't good evidence, that, you know, or where it wouldn't get into those sort of green shaded, um, where that there there is some evidence, that we, whether even if it's slight evidence of of an effect in humans or animals, um, would would end up in that gray, which on in this presentation we would have called indeterminate, so or you know inadequate to determine whether or not there's effect. So. We don't want to say there's no effect if there's potential for additional information that could could bring us to an effect. It's not part of our role to say that there's no effect. But but um, so if, if it's not part of your role, I'm I'm just um, I'm trying to understand this better and also again relate this back to how we've how we've looked at this in in you know in other exposure effect type of of scenarios. Uh, why, if it's not your role, then there there is the red category, right? Um, which um, you know, uh, red might mean something bad, but in reality, that's something good, right? Um, that, <laughs> right. Strong, that that you have a strong that you have a you have strong evidence, as you as you said it for no effect. Again, um, this has been a debate that has been ongoing, but in in. Once, if that can be assessed, I'm always asking myself, why wouldn't we also, why wouldn't we also be assessing um, or expressing that we have low confidence in no effect, right? Which may be a result of a of a um, of a assessment, but I guess it is the precautionary principle that um, yeah, that makes I, I think in yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. I think in practice, it also it would be it would be difficult to implement. Um, you know, if you have if you have null studies, there you know there could be, as particularly, uh, I, I'm speaking as an, you know, environmental epidemiologist. Uh, in many cases, in, you know, a null study is really difficult to interpret because of issues of sensitivity, 
Um, there could be exposure level issues or sample size issues or some other sensitivity issue that makes it difficult to interpret the null result. And so I would never want to have a body of evidence that was primarily null. Um, and and I, I, I would just want to be very confident before I said anything that indicated that there was no effect. So. Yeah. Uh, well, all that I'm saying is what what, um, what where I'm where I'm lost is what you say when you have low confidence in no effect, right? That's where I think that would be very that would be very interesting to sort out and and understand understand better um, because that's yeah, that may, that scenario may arise, right? Where does that fall? You cannot say yeah. You cannot put it that would, that would fall that would fall into that gray area of inadequate or indeterminate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, okay. I'm just going to interject here because we have a couple of questions from the floor, oh, which sorry. are very more general. Um, I have some questions too, though. Yes. yes. And I'm just going to take a couple from the floor because we have quite a large audience, so we just want to make sure that they're yeah. uh, contributing. Sorry, I didn't so, um, so basically, we have uh, a question from Nagesh Gureshi. I have to apologise for pronouncing that incorrectly, I'm sure. Um, about how uh, I think probably this is relates mainly to you, German, is how did you evaluate risk of bias and how many tools did you use to come up with your evaluation? And I think it would be interesting also to hear from uh, Erin and Beth as to the risk of bias assessment tools they used as well. And if I could ask you guys to somehow answer that question in one minute each uh, to keep conversation moving, that would be great. So German, if you'd like to start. Yeah, sure. Uh, actually, we have adapted the uh, TPOHA tool, the only tool that uh, we have been for sure using as a guideline, but uh, adapting for the specific uh, body of evidence for epi studies, we obviously adapted the questions for the in vivo studies as well, but also for each endpoint specific. So there are some broad questions that has been answered for each uh, study in terms of exp experimental studies. But in that case, we have several endpoints that has been refined in terms of uh, outcome, outcome bias. And we can appreciate that many studies, for example, are following the same trend in terms of, of reporting. So that can help us to establish the same uh, tool for in a study base. And then we uh, establish the specific uh, heat map for each uh, endpoint exposure base. That's uh, our approach. Thank you. And you did a lot of work on the risk of bias or internal validity assessment side. So if you want to give a very quick overview of that. One of you needs to <laughs> Wait, sorry. Uh, we can go next from the EPA. Uh, so we, we had a little overview in our slides. Um, if you look at our domains that we use, you can see they're pretty similar to the um, and TP OHAT domains, there's a lot of overlap with those, but um, one difference with ours is that we, we take the approach of separately evaluating risk of bias and sensitivity. Um, and, and we do that just because that's kind of a, uh, it can be an important distinction because sometimes if your only concerns about a study are for the sensitivity, then your interpretation of the data might be a little bit different than if there was a concern for bias. So. That, that's one, um, I, I guess, unique aspect of our approach. Thank you. Um, so Rebecca, I think we've got, sorry, we, uh, time is suddenly running short, but you have uh, time for a question, I think, to our participants, uh, our panelists. Right. Um, so German, not to leave you out, I had a, a question about your evidence profile slide. I thought it, it was great that you included that in your presentation. Um, and I'm hoping Camilla will bring that up. I just um, sent her a note. I think it's maybe the second from last or third from last slide. Uh, what I noted about it, because, you know, we've really in, in this talk and the one preceding it, we've been going over, you know, how do we handle multiple streams of evidence, right? And it, it brings you know, it, it expands our scope, it expands, you know, the resources needed and, um, 
and the work needed to go through all of the evidence. And then also, how do we present that evidence? And one thing that I, I noted in your evidence profile is you're working with um, you know, our standard gray domains. Um, and again, Camilla, if you have that presentation, it, it may be easier to see. Um, but you're also adding this domain at the end, um, talking about consistency, right? So you, you have this pairing between an issue of indirectness within the human data, I believe, which is then um, picked up again, I think it's second or third from last, um, within this domain of consistency between the human and the animal streams. And I think I wanted to hear from you, German, kind of the feedback that you received about having these two domains. And then if you had explored just, you know, not rating down for indirectness within the human data um, and providing an explanation with, with the supporting evidence. Um, uh, am I on the right one? I think it's towards the end. It's it's maybe you know second from last or third from last. Okay. But you probably German, you know better. I'll let you answer. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I think uh, I share a different presentation, but uh, it's probably oh, a before. Yeah. It's a ten ten slides before. It's a the the profile the, the overall profile table. Uh, was Rebecca? It was yeah. Yeah, it's just before. Jumana, do you want to share yours so then you have? Yeah, to yeah, for, for, for me. For okay, yeah. If I can, um, I'm not sure if I can. Yeah, you can now. Okay. And I don't mean to take time. I just wanted to get your feedback on on that use um, well, of the tool in the presentation. You're you're raising a very important questions when it's uh, the cross stream. Uh, evidence integration that it's a step that we have not addressing it uh, yet because we till now we have been share um, sharing the um, evaluating the integration in each stream independently but we consider the the inconsist the indirectness of the body of the in, of the endpoint as as a factor to increase or decrease the consistency as uh, considered within the NTP OHAT framework that it's a dual it's, it's a dual factor. Let me get this one. Is this one? Yes. Um... So here we have uh, in the NTP OHAT framework, uh, we can rate uh, both uh, the unexplained and consistency and consistency as upgrading and downgrading factor. So it's a, it's a, it's a factor that can be evaluated in, in, a, in a dual direction. So in terms of cross uh, model evaluation or cross species or integration of different streams, you saw that actually we have not evaluating in a stream way, but the outcomes were mostly stratified in primary and secondary outcomes, regardless of if they were in vivo or in vitro models. And we consider that all body uh, or outcomes were uh, apply to the research of endometriosis considering the limitations. So most, mostly we consider that is the best that we can do it in experimental research. We ag agree that uh, the whole st st gold standard model is in monkey studies, but there are many uh, endpoints that cannot be evaluated. So we consider that all studies are the best that mm -hmm. research can get right now. So probably this evaluation can move during the time and in 10 years, the experimental models might be seen in a different way, but our evaluation today uh, uh, reaches this, this, this uh, level of evidence. So, that was a, a, a rationale to, to evaluate the, the consistency. So we hope that next step will be the integration of epidemiological stream and uh, the experimental stream that probably we will address this kind of consistency across different stream of evidence. 
Okay, Paul, do you want to talk about the poll? Yep. So um, I think we're just about coming to the end of the call. Uh, we probably have basically ran out of time to address the more detailed question we have here. So I have to apologize to Dawei Tang for not getting to that. Um, we have an audience feedback poll, which is currently live. Um, so you can tell us how much, uh, what you thought about this session. Um, I certainly like to thank our presenters for their excellent talks. I certainly found them very interesting myself, for Holger and Rebecca for their thoughts and responses. Um, Katy, do you have any final comments you'd like to make? Uh, yes, I just want to uh, join you in thanking, uh, thanking everyone for, for their time and for this uh, discussion. You know, I, I wish we had a little bit more time uh, to continue, so hopefully we'll have, we'll have other opportunities to uh, reconnect and connect bi bilaterally to continue those discussions. But uh, I'd like to specifically ask, uh, thank uh, Paul for uh, doing most of the uh, legwork on putting this, uh, this together and uh, Rebecca and Holger and all, the, and all the panelists and Sebastian has been lurking in the background, but he is a backup for Paul in case something happens with, with Paul's connection. Um, so thank you so much. And, and this, uh, uh, this nice graphic uh, on the bottom of the screen is something that uh, also Paul came up with before Hamilton workshop. And we actually do, it's about evidence integration in case you were trying to figure out what it was. <laughs> but in case you wanted a t-shirt as a panelist, you, you can get one. Get in touch with Camila and we'll try to send one to you. But thank That's you again. Great. I think also we should emphasize that both GRADE and PBCC exist entirely to promote and develop understanding of systematic review methods in environmental health toxicological research. So if you have any questions at the end of this, you shouldn't hesitate to get in touch with any of us with those. We'd be very, very pleased to hear from you and very happy to engage you with anything that came up in the course of these talks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, bye. Bye bye. Thank you, all of you. Bye bye. Bye. Talk soon. Bye bye.